Happy Feast of St. Patrick to all of you, dear friends. Uh, it is not the Feast of St. Patrick in the church because it is a Sunday, and by tradition, saints' days are moved to other days when they fall on a Sunday. But I am confident that everywhere except in the church, St. Patrick's Day is in full swing and being observed in the normal fashion, which is to say with green beer and regrettable behavior. But we, at least in the church, shouldn't overlook St. Patrick entirely, I want to suggest to you. I just quoted to you a little piece of a poem attributed to St. Patrick. We have no idea whether he knew it, let alone wrote it. Uh, that's called, sometimes called the cry of the deer. Sometimes it's called St. Patrick's breastplate. Sometimes it's called the lorica. It turns out the word lorica in Latin refers to body armor. And so breastplate, body armor, but for some reason, the term got taken up by Irish Christians and was used more broadly than just by this, uh, this one writer of this one poem. So there are a number of loricas that we know of. Uh, there's another one that you may actually know already. If you know the hymn, Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart, also often sung on a day like today, uh, that is another lorica. The goal of all of them is to invoke the presence of the Holy Spirit, to call for protection from God to create a kind of holy space where something important and holy can happen. You may know that the, the hymn, St. Patrick's Breastplate, which uh, is, is well known to some in the church, is most often sung at ordinations, where we're calling for the sort of holy space in which a new servant of God in a new role will be made evident to the church in the way that the Holy Spirit comes upon someone in ordination. And the clergy who don't like this hymn very much because we sing it at every ordination and it does have seven or eight verses. Uh, but I can tell you, the, hit, the poem that it's based on is much, much longer than that. There are verses we don't sing that are wilder and stranger than the ones we do serve, sing, typically, that talk more about fighting with evil, fighting with the devil. So there's, there's much that's being brought into this idea that somehow there's a great deal that needs to be made holy if there is to be room for God to act, if we are to be safe in the presence of God. I'm not really usually one who is sensitive to the presence of, of, of spirit forces and that sort of thing, but I can say every time I sing that hymn, I can feel that something holy has been called into the presence of those who are singing it. Now, keep that thought in mind for a moment as we think about the gospel for this morning. This is another one of those occasions where it seems like it's a non sequitur. Jesus has asked a question and gives a completely unrelated answer that nonetheless seems to take us a lot further than perhaps the original answer would have. Some Greeks who have come up to worship in Jerusalem who are probably there in the same way we would be. You know, they, they've had this trip of a lifetime. They may never do it again. They want to make the most of it. So they're trying to, to check off everything on their bucket list. And meeting this charismatic young preacher is one of those things they want to do. So they go and they find Philip, who has a Greek name, so presumably he speaks Greek. And they convince him that this is a good idea. And then that group goes and finds Andrew, who also has a Greek name. And so this little... Greek faction gets together and goes to look for Jesus. They say they want to see Jesus. It's easy to play on the words here. See being, a, hi, how are you? Get a selfie on your phone and you go away. But in reality, in the end, they do see Jesus. They see the fullness of what it is God has been doing in the life and the ministry of Jesus and that is about to be accomplished in the things that are going to happen in Holy Week and in Easter. The response that Jesus gives is like a lorica. In a way, he's, he's conjuring this sacred space in which the, the great actions of God are going to be played out, a stage, if you will, on which these things are going to happen. He is telling us that something bigger than what has been going up on up to this point is about to be revealed, and we should be paying attention. This is by tradition called Passion Sunday, the last Sunday before Palm Sunday. By tradition, this is when the, 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 the deepest part of our observance of Lent truly began. In, 
traditional churches until fairly recently, the crosses were not covered until today. The images were not covered until today. Certain things were dropped from the liturgy today. At 8 o'clock, they heard that when we read the introit, there was no Gloria in it. This is where we begin to say, okay, we are coming to this time. Something different is about to happen. It isn't a bad time, dear friends, to think about what all of those events that are about to happen really mean. What is the crucifixion of Jesus really for? What does it do? How does it work? What is it supposed to be telling us about the goals of God for the world? To put it in very modern language. If we're at the sort of conservative end of the Christian movement, we might understand the purpose of the cross to be uh, paying a ransom for our sins. Jesus dies on the cross, taking our place in what should otherwise have been the punishment we deserve for the things we do. In technical jargon of the church, it's called substitutionary atonement. And there is some value in seeing it that way. Uh, I'm vividly aware of how much I sin and how little I am able to do to stop myself from sinning, let alone undo the consequences of my sin. That, I think, is something that only God can accomplish. So it is worth remembering that in some way I am personally connected to what happens at the first Easter. It is for me, it is for you, for every one of us as much as it was for those people 2,000 years ago. And this probably becomes more and more important as we get further away from it. At the same time, if you think about that explanation of what the cross is for, you begin to find inconsistencies and complications in it immediately. We're saying that there's a debt owed to God, that God is going to pay God's self, and somehow is going to do it by coming into the world. How does that work? And if God is capable of forgiving all of that anyway, why were all those intermediate steps even necessary? So there's got to be something more to it. If we're at the more progressive end of the Christian movement, we might be more inclined to see the cross as a way in which the world and its power tries to shut down God when God comes to point out the ways in which we are failing to live up to the image that God has for the universe. There were powerful people who had economic and political and social and presumably personal interests that Jesus was directly interfering with by pointing out the sinfulness of them. And so they shut him up. They shut him down as they will continue to shut down those who try to live godly lives in the world. Clearly there is some value in this too. You and I can look around us and see how this happens. We can see how the powerful and the wealthy and the influential will shut down those who presume to speak against what they're doing. Why should it be any different when it's God who's doing the speaking? At the same time, it doesn't seem to be quite enough, does it? Somehow it doesn't bring in the true full power of God, the power that lies behind some of those things that we do we human beings do to one another. So it doesn't really give the cross its full power. That's why it's fortunate that today we hear this little passage from the Gospel of John and we're given a third way. Jesus refers to now the ruler of this world is cast out. Now the, the way of this world is revealed for what it truly is. It might be helpful in thinking about this as 21st century people using the jargon we use to take out the word the world and substitute in the system and see whether there are systems that we can think of that ultimately bring nothing but death and destruction to this world. Each one of us could presumably come up with a list. I'll mention only a couple that came to my mind. One is consumerism our need to consume, our, our, the way that we damage ourselves, we damage others, we damage the world by the need to have more and more and more and more. Did you know, dear friends, that there are 168 million children around the world who are making our cheap clothes? 
in a recent survey of factory workers assembling Apple products in China, which pretty much every one of us has in his or her pocket at the moment, it was reported that more than half of them work 60 hours a week. These are the ways, dear friends, that we devalue one another. These are the ways that we deface the image of God in other people simply by our need to have more stuff. And that's before we even get to what having all that stuff does to each one of us as we lug it around through our lives. Only this morning in my little meditation on silence, I talked about noise as a possession. One more thing that we drag around with us. It's a little bit ironic that I'm standing here talking about it, but you know, take that for what it's worth. Perhaps that makes it even more evident that in fact we have so many things that we carry with us that in some ways deface the image of God even in us. Another obvious system is the system of power and violence. In 2023, there were 656 mass shooting incidents in the United States. That's almost two per day. In 2023, there were 18,800 gun deaths. And that's excluding suicides. That's just where someone shot someone else. If you do the math, that works out to an average of two every hour. That means, on statistical average, two more people will have been killed with a gun by the time we're done here this morning. There's one theologian, modern theologian, who talks about the myth of the cleansing power of violence. How much all of us have internalized the message that there are things we can only solve violently. And that somehow, by getting even, we will make everything right again. That is what Jesus is calling out. All of those things, big, small, obvious, hidden, things we take for granted that deface the image of God in every one of us, and that ultimately must be identified as a struggle with evil. We don't often name evil as a thing, let alone something that we should be fighting against. And yet, that is what Jesus is saying. The cross is for us the revealing of the way in which God is in combat with evil and the way that each one of the followers of Jesus is likewise called to be in combat with evil. Up to this point in Lent, we have been pretty inwardly focused, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Now, if I've only just confessed to how sinful I am, it's probably a good idea that I take time periodically to recognize that in myself. And I would think that would be true for almost everyone. But we are coming to the point now when our attention is turning out and up to see what it is that God is beginning to do, what it is we have been preparing for, now is the time when the holy space begins to be drawn in which that great drama of the power of God and the power of evil will contend once again. And we will see once again that in the end there is no power that will resist the power of God. There is no evil that will withstand the power of God. The worst the world could throw at Jesus was death and it didn't work. So now, dear friends, is the time for us to begin also to call for that holy space to be drawn around us. A space in which that powerful drama of God's action will be played out in our hearts as much as it is here in the church. We will be reminded once again that we also are part of the story. We will be drawn into God's story way back to the beginning of Lent. Now is the time to begin to call on God for our own lorica, our own body armor of the spirit, our own safety and protection as we also come into these holy events. May it be so for you and for me in all of the days that follow. Amen.